this is not two teams playing against each other, but all of us playing with each other. So, all right, so let me get my screen sharing. I just need you guys to tell me that you can see my slides. Yes. Moving. And if you see my slides moving, I'm good. Yeah, yeah they can. Yeah, right. perfect. So, see this next one? Yes, it's all, all right. about you. All right, yes, that is all about me. And that's all, okay. story end. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, lateral hernias is a subject rather like the Dalmatian horse. You may have heard of it. You may have seen one maybe somewhere, but you really don't know much about it. At least most people don't, unless you're a real aficionado of the subject. So let's start with how lateral hernias form. This is by no means a, a kind of a thesis, but a kind of a, a clinical outline of how lateral hernias form. Now this is a loss of domain with impending rupture in a patient who had this post-kidney transplant uh, incisional hernia, which uh, was detected uh, you know, at, at surgery too late. He came too late. He was uh, you know, living in a faraway country, which was torn by war. And by the time he came, he was already in end stage uh, liver failure as well as kidney failure. And somebody, uh, I saw the patient and recommended against operation. Somebody tried to operate on him. And unfortunately, the ending was not very nice. So this was through a pararectal incision, which was done for the kidney transplant. Now, this is the same patient. Another view, you can see the distended veins and the tense skin, suggesting impending rupture. This is a patient who had a lower abdominal incisional hernia, and that sagged pretty big. Now, this is a very unusual case. I'll remember this case for the rest of my life. This man was attacked by a temple elephant in South India, somewhere near Coimbatore, and the elephant uh, gutted him, actually. And he was brought to hospital. They did a very good job of resuscitating him. And then subsequently, I fixed his incisional hernia, which was a lateral incisional hernia, uh, in a conference in Coimbatore. So lateral incisional hernias can look like this on uh, high quality 3D reconstruction techniques. This man had a bone fracture in his leg and they had to take a graft from the ileum and that led to the muscles getting torn off the uh, insertion or origin into the iliac crest and a hernia formed here. So this is the appearance of that patient. Now, this is another typical hernia at the end of an upper abdominal horizontal incision. That could be a Makuchi, that could be a Chevron or a Mercedes Benz or a horizontal transverse incision. Now, this patient underwent an open appendectomy and she had this huge hernia, which has reached this stage over a couple of decades. So these things don't grow overnight, as we all know. And this is another uh, story of open appendectomy and how it can create such large hernias. Now, this patient had a kidney transplant at the site where they implanted the kidney. This patient had an incisional hernia. Somebody tried to repair it. It recurred. Somebody tried to repair it again. It recurred. And the patient came with this hernia. So this is, again, another pretty typical incisional hernia after kidney transplant. This is a very rare uh, image of an iliac bone graft that resulted in colonic injury. And obviously, uh, this led to a, a long-standing uh, wound healing process and an incisional hernia there. Okay, This is a picture of a patient who developed a lateral incisional hernia by coughing. Right? She did not have a history of surgery, but she had developed this upon severe coughing. So some cases might be traumatic or after severe exertion. And this is a case where you can see a bulge which has resulted from herpes zoster and the resultant uh, muscular uh, denervation that results in some cases. Now, this is another example of that. So zoster with the muscle weakness leading to 
uh, denervation uh, or lateral diastasis. Now, parastomal hernias are also another uh, typical uh, example of a lateral hernia. So I'm, uh, we're not going to talk of parastomals because they're a separate subject altogether. Now, this is a very, very unusual and rare case uh, of a post-tar lateral hernia. And you can see that this hernia is to the left of the midline and it is in between the vertically aligned mesh and the horizontally aligned mesh. So we had sutured the meshes together and the junction of these two meshes, you know, the, the weaving together of the two meshes, this junction had given way and the mesh <coughs> uh, and the uh, hernia record. So this is a very rare and unusual example of a lateral incisional hernia post tar. It's, it's uh, pretty much uh, unique uh, in my experience. So we know that the European Hernia Society has classified lateral hernias. So the lateral uh, hernias basically depend on the area around the semilunar line and the midaxillary line here. So if you take a line three centimeters above and below the umbilicus, so you have a subcostal, you have a true flank, you have an iliac, and lateral to all these is the lumbar area. So that's L4. So this is how the EHS classification happens uh, for lateral hernias. So L1, L2, L3, and L4. And we are now going to move on to why lateral hernias are different from midline hernias and why they are difficult. So if you look at the patient's uh, flank, if this is the head and side, and this is the rib cage, this is the linear semilunaris, below is the iliac crest, and behind is the defect in this given instance. So the area shaded in yellow is our area of dissection. And you can see that it is bound by bone on either side, top and bottom. And therefore, this immediately creates an issue for mesh overlap as well as for bringing the defect edges together. It is a problem because the bone is unyielding. Muscle and fascia can yield to a limited extent, but bone tends not to yield. And this area is also richly supplied with nerves. And you can see this image where you can see the genitofemoral nerve and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And this is a small video which shows the lateral pelvic wall where you can see the psoas, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and further up when you go, which you normally don't go in inguinal uh, taps or taps, you can see the ilioinguinal nerve and further up, you will be able to see another nerve, which is the iliohypogastric. So this nerve distribution is very important when you're doing surgery in this space. Another factor about lateral hernias is the associated pseudo hernia or denervation, which is very important in order to counsel the patient about the cosmetic appearance subsequently. Those who have only denervation should ideally not get a surgery. And those who have denervation accompanying a hernia should be informed about the contour changes not being entirely to their expectation. Now, how do you approach this as a surgeon? Obviously, the first thing you can think of is the old style open operation. Now, that open operation can be directly over the defect, over the weakened area. So that is classically now a lateral preperitoneal approach. Sometimes you may need to do a reverse star and that is going to be the subject of uh, Miguel. Uh, so I will not even go there. Alternatively, in certain cases, you can do a midline incision and go by dividing the transversus abdominis muscle, you can go into the lateral extraperitoneal space well beyond the linea semilunaris into that region. So that would be needed in certain cases and I'm sure Miguel is going to talk about that. The minimally invasive approaches are lap or robotic Classic is tap, old style is IPOM, becoming less popular 
for this approach, uh, for this class of hernias. And the other newer approach is the ETEP approach. Now the ETEP may be an ETEP with tar on that side. And on the other side, you could do a reef stopa kind of dissection, or it could be an entirely a lateral ETEP approach where you go outside the linea semilunaris. And you can also do a hybrid approach. Okay, so a hybrid would mean a minimally invasive and an open uh, together in some way or the other. So we are going to show a video of the lateral ETEP approach, which originally I learned from Jorge Dias. So there's always gratitude which comes out whenever we uh, talk about lateral ETEP, we talk about Jorge. So this is the patient and I would like you to have a close look at the CT findings of this case. So let's look at the CT. Okay. So we see that the midline is intact. This is the right rectus, this is the left rectus, the linea semilunaris is formed well. These are the three flank muscles. Okay, the hernia started appearing and now you see that the external oblique has a blunt end. This is the internal oblique, okay? And this is the transversus. So the defect is bound anteriorly by the posterior edges of the three flank muscles. And the psoas is on either side and just behind and extending further laterally is the quadratus lumborum. And here is the erector spiny muscle, okay? so. The hernia goes in between these muscle masses and is fairly wide. The hernia has significant content. It contains colon and it contains omentum. And now you can see that a small part of it is overhanging the bone and the rest of it is going down. And you can see that's metal from the hip operation that led to this uh, problem. Okay. So the patient is placed in the lateral position like this, well strapped. And that side hip is kept straight. And you do the markings and you're going to go lateral to the linea semilunaris into the retromuscular space. You're not going to go retro rectus, you're going to go outside the rectus abdominis. So the central uh, scope, uh, the central trocar is for the telescope and two accessory trocars for your left and right hand instruments. And you eyeball the instrument, uh, the, the defect uh, with good triangulation. <clears throat> so, the initial entry is optical. And in this case, I wanted to eyeball the hernia because there was colon and I wanted to make sure that I could reduce it under vision intraperitoneally. So uh, an assistant is pressing the hernia from outside and then we are reducing it. So the next port is done like a Phillips technique, though not quite, but kind of uh, like a Phillips technique where we are uh, creating a little bit of space under the muscles over the peritoneum and then putting in the cannula into the extra peritoneal space. Oops, I'm so sorry. Oh, I think I went into the next operation. What? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, yeah, sorry about that. So this is the uh, blunt dissection over the peritoneum and we are going to be placing that cannula in and fixing it Tight. All right. So now our accessory uh, ports are in and we start dissecting 
underneath the muscle. You can see the transversus abdominis and this is a combination of blunt and sharp dissection going step by step. You can be true preperitoneal or you can be true pretransversalis. I would go with whatever uh, comes easy and it might be different at different parts of your dissection area of your operative field. So you can see that we are using a bipolar instrument and just teasing off the fibers of the fascia transversalis from the undersurface of the bare transversus. And here we are now inside the defect itself. So the defect is big. The sac is very big. So we are going slow around the sac and trying not to open it straight away because that will create problems with pneumoperitoneum. And now you have seen that we are now mobilizing that hernia sac off the defect. And what you can see is the undersurface of the external oblique. So this is kind of, uh, you know, pretty common to see uh, an interparietal hernia. The external oblique is often intact and the undersurface of that hernia is the external oblique. The ceiling is the external oblique, the undersurface of it. So you're just teasing off all the uh, fibers connected to the edge of the defect and then additional dissection for the entire operative space is then uh, carried. We go down to the pelvis till you dissect out the entire myopectineal orifice because you need wide overlap, which is one of the most important things that one needs to do. Now, dissecting above, you see the dis uh, change in the uh, character of the fascia, that is the uh, psoas fascia, which is so strong and so distinct. You see that? That white uh, thing is the psoas fascia. It's the same as the fascia transversalis, except that we call it different at different places. It's the endoabdominal fascia, and at different places, it has different characteristics. Now, we are mobilizing the right colon extraperitoneally, that is the psoas, and you can see the nerve on top of the psoas. This is going at that white line where the kidney as well as the uh, ascending colon are attached extraperitoneally and we just keep mobilizing it. Now you'll see here that as we dissect more medially, we should shortly be seeing the gonadals and the inferior vena cava. Now, there you go. Just at the center now, you can see that inferior vena cava, which definitely should be uh, a hallmark of your dissection, and you should be able to cross the medial edge of that inferior vena cava. So, <clears throat> so that is the uh, defect, and we now start trying to not close the defect, but flatten it. So since this defect has bony margins, we cannot close it and it is pretty big. So what we do is we take bites from the edges to the undersurface of the external oblique. And once we start pulling the thread, then the external oblique gets pulled towards the edges of the defect and gives us a flat surface on which the mesh can integrate well. So this is, I think, an important step of the operation. And I'll be uh, waiting to hear from Miguel as to what he thinks about uh, you know, steps of the operation like this, or whether in the lateral uh, hernias, whether you can get away with placing a large mesh and not close the defect at all. So I would prefer to do something like this because it gives me a good facial bed on which the mesh can integrate. So this is the last bit of the suturing of the defect. Now the dissection area is complete, but it is irregular. Therefore, it is necessary to measure in multiple dimensions so that you can tailor the mesh in order to avoid areas where the mesh is wrinkled or folded and you don't want that happening. So you have to measure in multiple directions and be a little meticulous like a tailor in uh, trimming that mesh 
and it's it's a good idea because it's a very big mesh and a very uh, big space and a you know potentially a, a narrow space you can uh, lose your control very easily if you have pneumoperitoneum so you want to get that mesh in and tuck the lowermost edge under the right colon and the kidney so you just roll the organs medially pull the mesh as medially as you can till it crosses the inferior vena cava the psoas and it's as medial as you can make it now i must say that one of the problems with lateral hernias is that fixation is dangerous you can injure nerves entrap nerves and lead to tremendous pain post operatively so it you have to do this very carefully i was very meticulous about the location of the nerves and my taking sutures here to fix the uh, edges was the minimum that i felt i needed to but i was very careful i was pretty confident that i was not going to hit a nerve so uh, this is important that uh, fixation may have its own importance or not but what is important is getting wide overlap and getting the mesh underneath the uh, colon and the kidney so that when you tilt the patient the organs roll on top of the mesh and uh, the, the lower edge of the mesh and then trap that mesh so this is the operation and then we uh, take a look inside the peritoneal cavity and it looks pretty clean right so this is a different approach this is an etep left tar with rives a uh, right sided reeve stopa and a hybrid so it's a very uh, interesting uh, hybrid of uh, techniques including a staple retrorectus repair so this is a patient who had an um, incisional hernia on the left lower quadrant and i think this was related to some gynecological surgery um so we up entered from the right side normally as a, a right hand surgeon i entered from the left rectus now this time i entered transperitoneally first and this was an irreducible hernia so i did the adhesiolysis from inside and you can see it does contain a fair amount of bowel <clears throat> so i wanted to make sure that the adhesiolysis was done safely and without uh, any bowel injury or contamination so that the plan could change in case something like that happens i can always change my plan without dissecting the retro retromuscular spaces i am now assured once my uh, bowel is uh, lysed completely and safely then i'm sure that i can uh, do the retromuscular dissection without uh, having to abandon it uh, in some way or the other so now i start doing the etep uh, space creation and this is like a regular space creation uh, so this is only difference is this is on the right side not the left side so we are going to be looking uh, towards the linea alba from the right and not the left and the linea semilunaris is going to be to the right of our screen unlike in the left side where the linea semilunaris would be to the left of your screen okay so that's the lower part of the dissection that is the linea alba now and because this was reoperative surgery there were plenty of uh, lesions there now this is the crossover and this is made difficult because we have already created pneumoperitoneum so you can see that the crossover is challenged by the limited space so it does require a certain amount of experience to handle pneumoperitoneum early on uh, during the etep dissection and Uh, now you can see that we are incising the left upper posterior rectus sheath the prs on the left side is now being incised so that i can place a trocar there okay so now we will place the upper left retrorectus trocar so that i'm using uh, an optical uh, instrument to get into that space okay so now all we need to do is bring down the midline just like in a regular etep so i will not uh, waste time on this part but i will show you what we did different 
So I created around five to six centimeters of space from the xerfoid. So now you can see that volcano sign. Now, then I pass a green cartridge into GIA stapler, or this is an Ethicon stapler. So I fired the midline together. Okay, so this is the stapled retrorectus repair, which I'm kind of fond of. And I was uh, <laughs> doing work on studying the results of this, uh, but uh, COVID happened and we may have to start picking up the pieces now. So the last bit of the stapler firing of the midline is happening here. So on the ceiling, you see the linea alba and below is the reconstituted posterior rectus sheath. So my entire retromuscular space is now created except for the area of the hernia sac. Now that is the part where we have to go lateral to the hernia defect and to the pelvis on the left side. So we would be in need of doing a transversus release on the left side. So this is one of the important things for the young surgeon to understand that when you are approaching the lateral space from the retrorectus area, you would need to go extra peritoneal. And the way we do it typically is by releasing the transversus abdominis and then going underneath the transversus muscle and aponeurosis over the peritoneum. Now where we have a lateral uh, hernia, we open up the sac and that allows us then subsequently to go kephalad in the transversus release uh, procedure. That part of the operation is now continued. You can use any device you like. You can use a bipolar, you can use a monopolar, you can use ligature, you can use harmonic, thunderbeat, whatever uh, you have. That is not the big thing. The instrument is secondary. Your knowledge of anatomy and your bimanual skills and your patience, all of these things matter more than the instrument. So you can see that now we are medial to the semilunar line and the neurovascular bundles, and we are going ahead with the tar and going towards the left flank. So this is uh, the part of the hernia sac. So we're just going past it above and below. I'm just fast forwarding that part. Nothing very interesting. That is more of that uh, transversus division happening. Yeah. So now you can see that yellow fat. That is when you know that you've, uh, you're on safe ground, right? You just stay above the fat and that is your tar plane laterally. So we are continuing the last part of that dissection there. So we are disconnecting the facial attachments of the hernia edges from the peritoneum and the extra peritoneal tissue there. Yeah. So that bit of the tar is being completed. And now you can see that the pelvis is being dissected. You can see the iliac vein there. That is the space of Redzius. Okay. Now, the thing is, even in a, a long operation, you still have to be meticulous when you're dissecting the uh, pelvis because you would otherwise have bleeding. There was nothing here actually, but since the colon was stuck and I uh, released it with harmonic, I just thought I would sleep better by taking a couple of ceramuscular bites and just uh, burying them. Okay, so the next step obviously would be to close the peritoneum and that would take care of uh, the issue of exposing the bowel to mesh, uncoated mesh. So that part of the operation would be over. And this is actually one of the easier parts of the operation, but nonetheless a very important part because if your bites are too loose or too tight, uh, you can have bowel pop out in the post-op period and that would be an enormous disaster. So that is the peritoneal closure that's getting complete. 
And now, uh, at the end of it, what we did different, or well, this is uh, the staple midline from below. You can see that linea alba from uh, seeing above. Now that is a big sack, very big sack. And a scar here, we just decided to excise that scar and excise the sack as well. So if you leave such a large sack by doing uh, an ETEP, you would have problems with seroma. Yes, we do imbricate the sac from inside and all that, but this sac was really very, very big and extensive. I wouldn't have been able to imbricate it throughout. So now I take interrupted sutures. Uh, don't tie them, just uh, keep them, uh, you know, interrupted and attached to uh, clamps and then pass the cannula through it. So from below the uh, through the defect, we are now looking at the upper part of the abdomen and the remaining part of the tar is now done. So that part is the one attached to the diaphragm. You can see the vertical fibers of the diaphragm above. So we are completing the upper part of the tar. Okay. Now this is midline closure. So we are bringing the upper part because if you remember, I did not staple the first six centimeters of the linea alba uh, because I needed that space for the 60 mm cartridge to be uh, brought in. And so that upper part of the linea alba, I'm suturing. Now the rest of it is as usual. We measured the space in all the dimensions. And you can see the interrupted sutures. We have still not tied them. We will tie them at the end. Right, so then measurement is done. And now we take a large soft mesh, trim it appropriately. And then we mark it and then roll it through the lower part, the, the lower trocar, and then we unroll it all the way till the entire operative field is covered with mesh coast to coast. And then at the end, we just tie the uh, interrupted sutures and that is the cosmetic appearance of this procedure. Okay. The key points in ETEP for lateral hernias is that you must do extensive dissection. You must come to the medial border of the psoas major muscle and you must go towards the midline if you're just going a unilateral uh, retrorectus approach with tar or if you're doing a lateral approach, then your coverage should be till the linear semilunar is for sure. Okay. The fixation is a secondary issue. Uh, so the key to success would lie in having a large mesh overlap. So this is the kind of uh, patient position and the table breaking that we need to do. So the takeaway points uh, from my side is that the wide retromuscular dissection has to be done wide mesh overlap has to be done and be very careful with fixation. What are the results of this kind of approach? We really don't know. The initial results seem to be promising. The number of studies is uh, very uh, limited. The number of cases is very limited. And uh, I hope that uh, over a period of time, we will be able to get the kind of results that we see in our clinical practice where the patient uh, seems to love the kind of results that we are giving, but over a longer period of term, uh, we need to see what we are really doing. So some of these uh, results are uh, very, very dramatic and interesting. So this is a polyparastomal hernia anyway. So I welcome you all on November 7th to join us for the ANZOR meeting. That's a transcontinental meeting between the AWR surgeons community and the ANZ hernia, Australia, New Zealand hernia society. So I'll be very, very happy to see you all there. And thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, John. So you're going to take the word and I'm going to make my presentation. And that after the RAM presentation is 
probably you're going to be very disappointed <laughs> because it's, uh, we have uh, observed very amazing uh, skills, laparoscopic skills of uh, such a huge dissection. And the, I think that the main principles in laparoscopic approach is quite similar to what we are uh, really doing in, in what we are doing in, in, in open surgery. Let me check if I can share my, my presentation. Give me a minute. Okay. Yeah. Can You're you there. see? Yeah, perfect. I'm there. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have uh, co-authored this, uh, this talk because uh, Javier Lopez Moncruz and Luis Alberto Blasquez has uh, worked along with me for many years and we have come to very similar conclusions and, and many of, the, of, the, of our thoughts and, and way of dissection this, of these uh, lateral hernias uh, are based on what we have uh, learned together with uh, very good advices. This is my conflict of interest um, with several companies, of course, abdominal wall messes. And, and I want to also insist in the specific characteristics of these lateral hernias, because we are probably, apart from facing an hernia, many times we have to face a paralysis, a bulge that we have also to fix. The bone limitation has been already remarked by Ram, and uh, Another interesting issue is the, that the defects are not only of a muscle or a delineal, but like in the midline. Here we have two or three different defects in three different layers, and we have to try to solve them. And uh, the, the way to, 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 to repair these hernias are based, of course, in, in, in the principles of a retromuscular poor perpetual repair and adding a reverse stars if necessary as uh, Ram has also uh, insisted. I'm very happy to see how uh, quite similar our conclusions are uh, in this lateral hernia, similar to Ram experience and another experience like uh, Victor Radu or uh, Igor Velasky or Brad Burdakov are uh, taking in, in, in any part of the world. So uh, in, 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 in our international hernia collaboration, we have discussed a lot about this and how we fix this and we have learned from each other. This is the specific characteristics. Uh, in the lateral hernias, we don't have any aponeurosis. The external oblique aponeurosis is simply just not there. Uh, we have three holes, the bone limits and the muscle paralysis. Let me insist that if you are planning to put an onlay mesh over the muscle, it's not gonna work like in the midline. Maybe an onlay mesh could be done in the midline, but here in the lateral side of the abdomen, we are only, we don't have any aponeurosis to fix our mesh and we are only fix MS to the fascia of the muscle, but not their aponeurosis. Look at this beautiful picture. This is the myo, myo aponeurotic limit of the external lobe muscle here with this shape. So outside the myo, myo aponeurotic limit, we don't have any um, aponeurosis to fix our meshes. So please, uh, one message, forget about put an only mess as the repair of these incisional lateral incisional hernias. Of course, we, we, we need to, 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 to have the, in mind that the bilia crest is very, very close to the last ribs. And also, posteriorly, the 12 rib also makes the limitation with the posterior iliac crest because some problems of the lumbar posterior incisional hernias are there involve also the quadratus lumborum and the insertion, the posterior insertion of the traverse of the muscle. And we need to make this configuration that also Ram has shown us in the laparoscopic, uh, in the laparoscopic dissection. So in order to understand why the preperitoneal, preperitoneal retromuscular preperitoneal is the better way to fix this uh, lateral incisional hernias is the insertion of the, um, of the um, lateral abdominal wall muscle. The external oblique muscle inserts over the, eight, the last eight uh, ribs. The internal oblique only inserts in the inferior border of the 12, 11, and 10 rib. And finally, the transverse abdominal muscle inserts in the posterior aspect of the 
last six trips. And they continue with the fibers of the diaphragm over there. We are able to, to draw the fascia transversalis and the fascia diaphragmatic over there. We can observe that the, and the peritoneum is underneath, that the best of the plane to have a very good overlap is precisely the preperitoneal plane. So here in this part of the, of the abdomen, in the superior part, mainly in the superior part, the, the peritoneum is very thin. So we advocate always to use a pretransversalis plane above the costal, um, the costal margin. But in the inferior part, you can go completely preperitoneal due to the fat distribution, the preperitoneal fat distribution in, in the abdomen. What can, is, what can be the problem of incisional hernia is that uh, we, have, uh, uh, we may have a bulging like, like this, or we may, this is not a true hernia, it's a bulging after a repair, and we have a hernia and a bulging together. If we, made a, a, we have made a, a thorough review of the lumbotomies to, to, to see the events, the abdominal wall events uh, in terms of bulging or hernia, and in the, the, this is the final numbers that around 20% of lumotomies, one every five patients develop a true hernia or bulging. That's a lot, no? I think it's a, it's, it's a, a real problem and something should be done also in order to prevent. Eh? So the, we, I, I belong to a group of, of surgeons now we are working in, in the prevention and we call it a pop surgeons. The, um, promise of prevention or something like that, no? But so you have to take care in, in this, uh, the, that the, the bulging could be very, very high after a lumbotomy. And the anatomical reason is quite simple. Uh, it, has been, um, it has been described in anatomy that the, the, the T11 and T12 nerves runs under the, the ribs and they give the, the, both uh, nerves, the 12 and the, um, the 11 and the 12 nerves, are the main trunks that innervate the rectus abdominis muscle. So any, any injury to these nerves, apart from weakening the, uh, the lateral abdominal wall muscles have, are gonna be uh, associated to a, a weakness or atrophy of the ipsilateral rectus abdominis muscle. This is an example, this is a CT scan of a lumbar hernia over there that is partially covered by the external oblique muscle. And you can see, that in the inferior part, apart from um, another midline hernia, the patient has an asymmetry in the abdominal wall. The midline is not in the midline. <laughs> the linea alba is, uh, um, is uh, tracked from the, the contralateral side because of the weakness of the area of the, of the, of the hernia or the bulge. So the, the we have to bear in mind that in, if you don't make a, an appropriate lobotomy and you don't follow the nerves in, during the incision, these nerves are going to be injured, are the most important nerves innervating the anterior abdominal wall. So I have also uh, uh, insisted about the, the different holes that we may have in lateral incisional hernias because because we have three different muscles. So we may have three completely different defects in external oblique, internal, or transversus abdominis muscle. Most of times, the, the internal oblique and transversus abdominis defects are parallel or very, you know, can be perfectly overlapped, but the external oblique muscle doesn't. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this uh, very small clip of video to see you that this is a very big defect on the external oblique muscle over here. Look at the fibers of the external limb muscle. This here is the, a completely weakness over here. Can you see the different the thickness of the external limb muscle here and here? And here is completely deleted. And you can see here the internal limb muscle coming in a perpendicular way. And the, the defect in the transverse of the limb muscle is, 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 um, is, um, is not as big as the defect of the external oblique muscle. So how we want to solve the problem? I think that a laparoscopic approach, it could be quite a good option. The retromuscular proportional plane and use of reverse start can help us to solve this problem. So the, we can place the mesh in different, uh, different layers. Uh, of course, the mesh layer, I have insisted that it's not recommended, and we can use it in preperitoneal retromuscular. That's, 
our way to go. Maybe in some exceptional circumstances, you can use an iPhone, but I don't see the, the possibility of using an intermuscular mesh because of the insertion of the muscle in the costal border. So in our current approach is that in small defects, less than five centimeters, we are trying to make any tap or tap uh, approach to cover this uh, very small defect over here, over the iliac crest, and we place our mesh uh, in, with taco configuration over the psoas muscle, and I think it's a quite a good way to go. In large defects, we haven't tried yet the tap, but after Ram's uh, talk today, we will have to try to do something about that, of course, and, and trying to improve. And we, in large defects, we, we, we try to make an op an abdominal wall reconstruction with the use of, of retromuscular plus a reverse star. So the tips and tricks are, 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 are maybe very useful to, to make this. And the first one is the position of the patient. We don't place the patient in a complete decubitus, lateral decubitus. We made a modify 30 degrees. And the reason is because we extend our dissection to the, to the ipsilateral cooper ligament and upwards almost to the central tendon. And so we, we, we place it very laterally. We, I, I personally get lost. So I prefer to make a modify, you know, and also I can turn the, 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 the table uh, to, to facilitate my dissection. And also the pre-extension is, is, is good to separate, to, the, uh, to enlarge the distance between the iliac crest and the 12th rib. But remember that after placing the mesh, you have to restore, to unflex your bed. If not, you're going to have a bulging after the repair. So um, uh, we need to make, uh, as I completely agree with Ram, that we need a, an overextended section. And the first thing, if we make an open approach, is to make the, the same incision and to look through the scar for the best plane that is behind the traverse of the muscle. You go in a circumferential way around the, the defect to find this space. And then you have to extend your dissection to get enough overlap. And we divide anatomically in three parts this extension of your dissection. First one is the subdiaphragmatic space that you need to develop. The second one is the iliac. The third one is the posterior. And the last one, in my personal choice, the last one is to go medially because you have already released the tension in the peritoneum and could be, you can also develop the peritoneal plane over there easier. So this would be my preference of order, first subdiaphragmatic, then iliac, then posterior, and finally subdiaphragmatic. The subdiaphragmatic decision, this is the, learn, the lessons that we learned from TAR, that you can extend following the traverse of the muscle to the diaphragm, the plane, and this is a cadaver dissection, is also available in, in our YouTube channel you, that you can, after making the posterior component separation and making this dissection, you can reach four or five intercostal spaces very, very, uh, and, uh, and, and obtain a very good overlap. This is the a, a lumbar hernia treated in our department, and you can see here the scar after the control two years after the procedure that we have gone very highly in the in the over the diaphragm here, and the, you can see here the extension or the permanent synthetic mesh over there. That's the thing that's the way the success of these repairs are again the hyperextension of the overlap. In the iliac area, you, you need to remember the anatomical, this uh, cadaver, uh, cadaveric uh, dissection to differentiate the femocutaneous nerve, the genitofemoral nerve, and, 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 to, and the psoas muscle coming here to the retroinguinal area and the borus space, and this is quite important to develop also to extend your mesh almost to the Cooper ligament. This is our, our best friend of any abdominal wall reconstruction, the fixation to the Cooper ligament. Let me show you this picture, the, this is also a cadaver, and uh, we have already made a, a posterior component separation here, a, a tar, but it's not a, a tar, it's a, our Madrid modification, we have left all the traversal of this muscle uh, with the insertion in the posterior retusive. And, and this is the relations, anatomical relationship that you have here in, in, the, in, the, in the lumbar hernias. If we place here the hole of the lumbar, 
we can see here the transversal muscle, the diaphragm in continuity with the with the transversal muscle. The psoas is over there. This is the quadratus lumborum, and this is the insertion of the transversal muscle. Sometimes with an aponeurosis covering the quadratus lumborum. You can of course identify here the 12th rib, identify here the iliac crest, and of course very important. As Ramana has uh, remarked, please uh, identify the nerves. Here we have a common drone, the femoral cutaneous and the genital femoral nerve. And sometimes we can have even dissected the 12th intercostal nerve in these lumbar incisional hernias. And you, you know that uh, from America came the, also the possibility to use um, Bone, bone anchor fixation that was promoted initially by Alfredo Carbonell, and we have only barely used it because we prefer hyperextension instead of fixation. You, again, take this picture in the cadaver after making a posterior component separation, you can see your limits here and you can extend in the retroperitoneum very nicely and here in over the diaphragm here and here over the psoas, making the taco configuration of your mess over there. I think that's the secret. So uh, uh, we learn also from 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 the United States that it would be very wise to extend your mer posteriorly like this. You, uh, Ramana has also show us a, a, a similar picture from Igor Belansky to to extend your mess here over the quadratus lumborum and the psoas muscle, making what has been called the taco configuration, the Mexican taco configuration. In the case of the cadaver decision that I have already shown you, I, if we place ideally a mess, we will have to make this configuration of the mess in order to wrap posteriorly all the, uh, the, all the, all, all the, um, all the retroperitoneal plane here and to cover it with your mess. The tricky thing is the medial, the medial, the medial dissection. Having released the tension in the peritone over here, we can extend in it completely true preperitoneal plane over here until the linea alba is necessary. When the, the lateral incisional hernias involves the linea semilunari, I agree also with Ramana that could be also very, very wise to extend your decision to the contralateral rivers uh, space. It depends on the location of the lateral defect. Here is a, an example that in this lumbar hernia, it's a very big one, we extended completely preperitoneal our dissection here and this is the starting the superior part over the diaphragm here and you can see here that my hand is touching the linea alba without entering the peritoneum here you can see here the the, the change to the pre fascia diaphragmatica plane is more bleeding in our experience when you go and keep your plane peeling off the fascia diaphragmatica and you can see here that i'm putting my hand to the linea alba and to the cooper ligament through the preperitoneal dissection. The problem is that sometimes the peritoneum could be so thin that instead of going completely preperitoneal, we need to perform what has been called a reverse star. A reverse star because we go, we come from a retromuscular peritoneal plane that could be easily detached from the peritoneum to a very difficult plane here of the peritoneum stuck to the to the traverso abdominis muscle and the posterior to seed, so you can cut the traversal muscle and come to the posterior red to sit. You know that we are going to extend our decision here, 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 and, and try to preserve as much as possible the, the, um, the traversal abdominis muscle. And I, I put in the, the, this clip of video because it was operated by Javier Lopez Monclus. He has gently let me show this video of this huge lumbar incisional hernia. This is the defect. You can see here that some, there are always some cover fibers of the external oblique muscle. The first thing to do is, of course, to, to make uh, uh, open the, the sac and be sure that there's no intense sensation there. You can see here that coming cranially and medially is a very tricky thing is to keep your plane in a pretransversalis plane. You can see here the difference here between the peritoneum and a pure pretransversal plane that when, when extending your dissection cranially to the diaphragm, this is a, the, the fibers of the diaphragm, you go in a pre-fascia diaphragmatic plane. 
we overextended the extension, and you can see here that, oh, sorry. Let me come back to the video. That we had a, Javier met the problem that the peritoneum here was really, really, really very thin. So what, uh, then the plane A can be, so plane B. So with a burn on the posterior to sheath, you identify the contraction longitudinally parallel to the linear alba of the fibers and you enter on the posterior to sheath. Here you can see very nicely the neurovascular bundles. And when coming cranially, we go parallel looking for the insertion of the traversatorist muscle on the posterior to sheath and avoid the cutting of the posterior to sheath. You go up, 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 and in, in the left um, corner, inferior corner, you can see here how we are ascending in the, in the reverse stars of the posterior to sheath release here from lateral to medial. This is a laparoscopic view because we couldn't go on with the, with the, the conventional camera to show you that we are completing the detaching of the traversal abdominis muscle. Here is the end of the, of the dissection, quite near to the fatty triangle of concept near the sub siphon region. This is the, the limit of the, our posterior to see release that is coming here. You go, we go very medially uh, in the superior part of the section. This is coming inferiorly. And here we are gonna meet the linear quota. The pigastric vessels. Here we are finishing the cutting on the posterior to sheath to meet the linear quota, the refuse space, the pigastric vessels, and dissect our way down to find the Cooper ligament. Again, the laparoscopic uh, view in order to show you the area of the Cooper ligament. In the iliac area, it's important to identify the, the structures in the retroperitoneum, the nerves. Here is a constant vessel here. This is the, the inferior circumflex vessels that innervate the, that make irrigation to the, to the lateral abdominal wall muscles, the psoas muscle, the quadratus lumborum over there, so the kidney side should be the, 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 the place of, of the kidney and then our overlap here, here to the midline. You can see here we have more than 20 centimeters overlap over there, 15 centimeters overlap. Here the hands of Javier to the Cooper ligament. And posteriorly pushing the, the peritoneum medially you can grab with your hands the, the viscera. And this is the close of the, of, the, of the peritoneum. And you know that we use the absorbable mesh that's gonna help us make this taco configuration. The rigidity of the absorbable mesh is gonna help us to make this configuration. So we're gonna place it Apart from the posterior reinforcement, the rigidity is going to help us to extend properly without any kind of fixation of the mesh. Look at the size of the mesh, 50 by 50. We are going to trim, of course, the mesh to adapt to the dissected space. And this is there to the Cooper ligament. And the only thing now is to wrap all your dissection with the Polypropylene mesh. It's very important to use an appropriate polypropylene mesh. This is a mid density, 50, 50 grams density. And this is the, the drain. It's important to properly close the defects and, and approximate layer by layer and two or three layers. The, sometimes we even implicate, we can also discuss this later, we implicate also the, the muscles in order to avoid as much as possible the bulging, and this is the 15 centimeter incision for 
this uh, difficult case. So uh, this is our result. We have together gather uh, Luis, Javier and I have personally uh, collected 73 patients, 24 L3, 20 L4 with 12 associated to midline. With a mean follow-up of 28, we have a, one patient with mortality, a clostridium sepsis in the second postoperative day, and a mean and hospital mean hospital stay of four days with two recurrences, five bulging, and two patients with pain. So this is the, the result you can obtain. This is a fourth postoperative day after a reverse stars and abdominal wall reconstruction in this quite obese patient, and he's ready to go home after the fourth postoperative day. This is also a case, uh, maybe this is the most difficult lumbar incisional hernia I ever operated, because when I opened, I opened the sac, I was not inside the abdomen. I was in the pleura. And the viscera that was underneath was the lung. So we have to reimplant the, 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 the diaphragm and make a, a retromuscular peptidal dissection. In this case, it was not necessary to perform a a reverse stars, but the results speaks by themselves. So the take home messages as very, very similar to, to, to RAM, uh, uh, take care of the anatomical uh, uh, landmarks, the myofascial limit, the neurovascular bundles, the nerves over the psoas, and the bone limitation. Search for the best plane is the retromuscular prepitonal plane, and then the second plan is to make a reverse star. A large piece of mess with a minimum 15 centimeter overlap, extension better than fixation. And I think the absorbable mess helps you to make this taco configuration. I can, we can discuss now, Ram, but not so much, I think. Well, Ram is back. Or you want to start that, first? Can I just say one thing? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Miguel, I'm a huge fan. Your presentations are fantastic. And, and I just love your accent and the way you say it. And of course, your work speaks for itself. You don't need me to praise you. The whole world recognizes your work. And I just want to say how privileged we are to be witness to your work and to share in it in some minor peripheral way for you maybe, but still it, it's absolutely fantastic the kind of work you're doing and even being aware of your work is a privilege. Thank you so much. No, no. I, it's it's a, a really honor to to be part of this uh, this uh, community of surgeons that uh, we have we are also learning a lot from you. So it's this is a, I think this is a scientific forum that I couldn't uh, thought about maybe ten years ago and has opened our minds a lot, you know. And and you know uh, who was telling me that I'm gonna make ITEP and I have made ITEP yesterday, another on Monday. So. You know, and this thanks for your, you know, for your, uh, your, your um, educational programs here and uh, through the through the net network. And I think that it, it's a, a great, it has been a great opportunity also for us to be part of this uh, scientific community. You know, it's uh, it's amazing the, the the wonderful things that we have learned during this uh, past uh, two or three years. No. And, and I think Javier and Luis will, will agree with me that uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to, to share with you what we have learned together, uh, 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 very, very close together working and with our cadaver dissection, we, we always uh, find in them an opportunity to, to learn more. No? And, and, and it's important to see how the, your conclusions are quite similar to, to ours, you know, regarding many things anatomical things, landmarks uh, about extension, better than fixation, you know, that so many things that uh, we have come to the same conclusion just working uh, uh, at a great distance, but uh, pretty virtually close together. Well, Thank maybe you. that's the only 
positive thing about Corona is that we intensified our contacts. Yes, yes. Because it's quite crazy since yesterday morning we are talking hernias. Yesterday it was nine hours, today it's gonna be a little more. At, are we still there? And I just don't wonder that you come to very similar conclusions. You did not change the anatomy. The anatomy is the same. The approach is different. But you, you know, Jan, I have heard in Europe this year, people using the plane between the external oblique and internal oblique muscle to lay the mess. Yeah. You know, you know that's completely yeah, well, contrary to my concept, you know. My, you know, does it does it by come example, from Valencia example, you know, too? Does it come no, from Valencia? No, 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 no. From <laughs> from very north, a very north country. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, I just I just wonder what uh, uh, Rahul uh, says to this point because uh, he was still in a starting position. How do you see the things? <laughs> see, whatever uh, in uh, lateral hernias, one should know clearly the anatomy of the uh, uh, the muscles flying, the bony structures, and you need to dissect uh, in between the planes, and that is most important, as as uh, rightly said by Miguel and as well as Ramana, that uh, one should always see the, uh, the dissection plane between the peritoneum and transocellus fascia that goes down and the muscle will be bared completely. And one should know the nerves going along with the uh, muscles and we should spare the nerves and then uh, put a mesh, uh, a very uh, huge big mesh in that particular plane that will going to give us a good results in case of a lateral hernia. That, that is the most important point uh, uh, those, these two speakers have made, that uh, the may should be very big. One should be very thorough with the anatomy to deal with such uh, complex hernias so, so that we can reduce the recurrence as well. But uh, I have really uh, mesmerized by the presentation of Miguel. He is uh, fantastic. And his work is a real phenomenal work he is doing. And he has, uh, first time I have seen this uh, reverse star, I have heard this reverse star since long back. But I want to know whether from where he is going for doing for this uh, reverse star. And he has very nicely demonstrated in his video that reverse star, where to go and from where he one should cut the transverse abdominus muscle. It's uh, really phenomenal. Thanks, thanks, Miguel, for uh, teaching us the uh, reverse star. Thank you. Well, uh, probably the most important for me, at least until now, is that the size of the mesh yeah. helps you to refrain from heavy fixation. Ram said that, well, people using uh, bone anchors and, and, but still, you know, once you start tacking, I just doubt that you can follow all the nerves all the way down. So when you hit one, you have a problem. And I think the solution of this is the huge overlap, as you've shown, 15 centimeters downwards, you know, so the mesh cannot move afterwards. And especially when you succeed to close the defect somehow or narrow it or make it more flat. Ram? You had a comment? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure about this, but this uh, concept which Miguel has uh, brought about as the Madrid modification of having a very thick uh, absorbable mesh as a scaffold on which you lay your soft mesh, which weighs around 50 grams, it increasingly looks and sounds attractive to me. I think that the scaffold for the mesh integration is going to be better because of the physical thickness of that absorbable material, which uh, kind of resists that mesh from getting uh, displaced or torn by the intra-abdominal forces. So if you 
use that kind of heavy, thick material under your mesh, you probably don't need to fix at all. Whereas if you don't use that thick absorbable mesh, maybe that mesh that we use, which is typically a mid weight or soft, uh, lightweight uh, macroporous mesh weighing 50 grams, maybe it might get a little displaced. Of course, the uh, issue of fixation is uh, very, very important. And everybody uh, believes, I, I think, uh, most people believe that in retromuscular spaces, fixation is less important. So maybe wider overlap is the key to having, uh, you know, the luxury of doing away with fixation. But I somehow like this concept of having that thick cardboard-like, uh, you know, scaffold on top of the uh, mesh. Well, Miguel, I, uh, I speak it out myself. It's bio A, isn't it? Yes, it's bio. okay. Well, no names, but uh, again, you know, it's it's it makes sense in the lateral position much more than in a midline position, because what what Ram said now you have a kind of three D configuration already made for that with the stiff mesh, and then you put your soft mesh on it. But may, may I, oh, sorry, Miguel Angel, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, well, by the way, uh, Javier, thank you for the very nice dissection in the film. Please <laughs> take lead. Go ahead. Okay, now I, I just wanted to insist in, is when we use it in the midline, uh, the concept of the bio A, we are in the midline, we are in a flat uh, plane, no? Exactly. But it's true that in the midline, we have all the pressure of the abdominal wall and the viscera gains the middle part of the abdomen. So the intention there is to protect the viscera. But when we are uh, talking about lateral hernias, uh, we are talking about working in a cylinder. And as you said, it's a, a mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, scaffold of the, of the bio A. It's not uh, because of protecting the viscera as, as it was the main intention in, the, in, the, in midline, but it's just to help us to use uh, give the right shape, cylindrical shape, to the polypropylene mesh. So that's uh, is, is, is the objective, to have something rigid to give us the, the right configuration of the lateral abdominal wall. Thank you. Rahul? Rahul? Yeah. I want to ask Javier that uh, how many days it is required for this bio-A to get completely absorbed? Because I feel this bio-A is giving uh, a time for this particular mesh to uh, integrate with the uh, the other structures and so that uh, that time is taken for the healing and then it is giving a good uh, corset like uh, rigidity for that particular repair that is what is my feeling is regarding this particular technique what is your opinion javier the the, the rigidity of the bio a uh, when we we, we have uh, reoperate some some patient with the with the bio a and we see that uh, uh, even with in the physical exploration without uh, any any rain intervention it's quite rigid the first 10 days after 10 days it fragments uh, and it becomes uh, softer but uh, i think there is um, i have the feeling it's it's hard to explain a little bit even more difficultly in english but uh, i have the feeling that you have the muscle you have the polypropylene mesh and uh, the bio a some some kind like um, it sticks uh, the the fibrosis through the uh, through the polypropylene mesh, and I think that uh, probably integration starts from the very beginning. And I think in in when I have reoperate a patient, for example, in the I have a beautiful picture. Actually, actually, I could look uh, during the discussion for for it. Uh, it was in the tenth postoperative day. I have to go back to the to the abdomen of the of the patient, and uh, there was a, a leakage, uh, an intestinal leakage. And in the area where, where there was no contamination at all, you could see the muscle, the polypropylene, and the bio-A completely integrated after 10 days, full integration of the, of the meshes. I, I will look during the, during the discussion for, for the picture because it's quite, quite interesting. Yeah. You can well, Luis, uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Luis, unmute yourself, please.
Try your best. Sigo relax, sigo relax. <laughs> yes, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm agree with, uh, with Javier. Uh, 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 I think that by the way, have um, uh, the, the, the example of a scaffold is, is, is very, very useful for the, the uh, for the. Um, uh, for how uh, BioA uh, acts in the in the in the reparation of, of the abdominal wall, no. I think that uh, apart initial rigidity and after that the fib the fibrosis who the mess uh, who generate the mess uh, reinforce the reparation, no. Uh, contribute to uh, uh, to gain more uh, more force more more to the for our reparation, no. I... Ram. Um, sorry, sorry, Miguel. No, Miguel. This, yeah. yeah. No, no I, I suggest, Ram, if you let us in in, in, in future sessions, we can, any, any of us can, can show you uh, the second look after abdominal wall reconstruction with this message. We have already operated 26 patients. And yes, because we have more than 150. So we have reoperated some of them, and I can show you pictures histology and try to convince you that we are not in a very bad, you know, <laughs> in, yeah. a very, in a very bad way. <laughs> that is brilliant. Uh, actually, but, uh, and, if, you, if you remember, uh, you are supposed to be one of our keynote speakers for the ENZOR meeting uh, on uh, November 7th. And the topic which we had given to you was uh, uh, open uh, reef stopa tar anatomy. So we could always change it and make it uh, <laughs> the anatomy of the redo AWR. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And another thing, uh, talking, coming back to the um, to the fixation on, uh, versus overlap. Um, in the in the, in in one of the cases of pain of chronic pain that we have after this approach, is because we early in the series fixed a lot the the mesh, and I had a. A relatively young lady, I think 60 something, that he, he, when he came back two years after the procedure, he told me that he, he had a, a hernia. He, he, she recognized that she had a, a very good bulge, but I have changed an asymptomatic bulge for a painful repair. You know, now he's under, under daily pills of, you know, of acetaminophen or whatever instead of an asymptomatic bulge so uh, so uh, this this uh, this uh, first uh, cases uh, change a little bit our our way to go and we are not uh, only we are avoiding fixation and maybe the only place we fix something is in the in the cooper ligament may i show you the picture that i talked about course. before yep Okay, let me share curious. my my screen. Yeah, it's quite it's quite nice. So it was a, a okay. Let me see. Okay. okay. Yes, here. Yeah, it was a huge subcostal incisional hernia. I had to do a right colectomy because a previous iPhone mess is stuck in the in the transverse column. Update. And uh, yep, can you full screen it? Yeah, of course. So this was uh, there was there was a leakage of the of the anastomosis in the tenth postoperative day. Um, so uh, there was no intraperitoneal contamination. All the contamination was extraperitoneal, and so I uh, opened the meshes to go to find the, the fistula. And can you see where I have all the contamination, the bio is fragmented, as, as I said before, and the polypropylene is not integrated in the muscle, but away from the contamination, can you see this, this picture? What, uh, this is what I found. Can you see the bio A, yeah. the polypropylene yeah. mesh, and they are already uh, getting stuck. integrated in the, in the muscle. Yeah, it's stuck in the muscle. So yeah. it's it's really in, it's re the fibroblasts are there since five days. Yeah. Yep, yep. So that was the picture I wanted to to show you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, may I comment with just one one thing? And I might 
uh, share the my Go ahead. my. Mm -hmm. So I I think uh, I it, it's really important to adequate uh, the uh, technique to the patient to to um, to measure how important is in each patient the denervation because it's true we can find several L3 incisional hernias with uh, no denervation at all and uh, all the way around L3, L4 incisional hernias with huge denervation. So my, my algorithm for, for uh, lumbar hernias and I love lumbars as uh, Luis uh, loved too because we, we love lateral, lateral hernias. Uh, I, I, I think that we should, I, I will share again my, my screen if you don't mind. Please do it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, again, uh, we have to insist that we are talking about an abdominal wall defect and also an abdominal wall denervation. And my algorithm would be like in L2, L3 small medium defects without denervation, without uh, an obvious volume. Uh, I think, or at least in my practice, my option is uh, an ETEP with a, uh, an ipsilateral posterior component separation to have a good overlapping of the mesh. And in low L3 incisional hernias, like in McBurney's uh, or similar uh, lower incision, my option is still to do a, a TAP uh, approach. Then in L3 um, with large defects with uh, important denervation, I prefer an open approach because uh, at least in my hand, I'm not able to, to manage uh, bigger uh, meshes, uh, meshes bigger than, than 30 centimeters. And uh, with the open approach, I can uh, get a better overlapping. And I think in L3, usually we can just reach the bone, the bone limits and it's not mandatory to, to overpass these limits. But in L4, a, a small or large, large effect with a large denervation. And my option is an overextended preperitoneal reverse star as Miguel Angel showed. In this case, we need to overextend cranially the mesh from the boundary limit, uh, the, from the bony limit and the same uh, caudally. So why, why uh, overlapping? Why so much overlapping? Many times, many uh, surgeons uh, have asked us why why is so uh, extensive the cranial uh, dissection? And this is the first uh, lateral hernia I uh, operate when I left uh, Coslada and I started working in, in Puerta de Hierro. And uh, after the uh, repair, uh, two years uh, after the repair of, of this patient, it's a kidney transplant patient, you can see that it seems to have a recurrence. If we see the uh, costal margin is here, the initial defect was here, it was an L3 uh, incisional hernia. And at that time at my hospital, I didn't have the 50 times 50 uh, polypropylene mesh. So I use a rhomboidal 30 by uh, 30 mesh and the limit of the 30 by 30 mesh is here. So here, uh, the border of the uh, costal margin and the border of the mesh acts like a true, uh, um, a true uh, hernia uh, ring. And it's a pseudo recurrence. If you see the the picture of the of the recurrence of the of the of the patient, there is not a true true defect. So it would be a pseudo pseudo hernia, and that's why we insist so much in uh, trying to overpass the costal margin in the in the cranial dissection. That's all. <laughs> well, thanks, <clears throat> Ramot. What do you think about it? Unmute yourself, please. Yes, I loved all the oh. patients, Ramana, followed by Dr. Miguel and Javier. In fact, his short slides were very educating. And uh, his explanation of why that overlap in L4 hernias uh, and how you can defer the approach according to whether it is uh, L3 or L2 that really clarifies the concept of how much overlap you should require and whether you really need to go beyond the costal margins or not in L2, L3. So I love that presentation. Really. Thank you. And lumbar hernia is hernias is kind of a specialist's game. Uh, I would say that 
it's one of the more complex hernias so a person who's in his learning curve if he wants to tackle lumbar hernias i think he may need to take help of a mentor of a or of a person who has got a little more experience and then fr can be a little more complex it is like that i love the concept the star and the question whether we could just do a pre peritoneal uh, section rather than go to the retractus plane because in this case uh, if you are using a pro okay, so that thin peritoneum would not matter and haver actually clarified it by saying that we always attempt pre peritoneal uh, dissection towards the midline between the linear and lunaris and line for proper overlap uh, if that's not feasible then we would do a reverse map I, I that clarification also. Thank you. Well, before I pass the word to Ram, uh, we were talking this afternoon, and Miguel, of course, too. We were talking about uh, lions. You know, if, if you want to become a lion, you have to train with lions. <laughs> and if you want to become a better surgeon, yeah, you measure yourself with the best. and this is the best example for something like this no matter what the approaches are so different but fixing the anatomical problem is actually that what we are talking about ram great a couple of uh, things uh, the first thing uh, which pramod uh, had mentioned is if you can do the entire thing pre peritoneally he is obviously talking about an open operation you don't need to do a reverse star and you know what is reverse star how will you identify where to start the division what if you divide the linea semilunaris throughout or things like that you know it's it's or and there are lots of questions that some surgeon may not even have the level to think of there are lots of problems which you may not even be able to think of uh, because you have no experience or awareness about this area and this uh, field the thing i would like to say is when you try to dissect preperitoneally at around the area of the linea semilunaris and medially it's going to be pretty hard to get a plane in many patients and i would say most patients you would tear the, at least i would tear the peritoneum up very well because from the linea semilunaris onwards to the under surface uh, of the posterior rectus sheath the peritoneum seems to be very strongly stuck in my patients okay mm -hmm. now those who can do a full preperitoneal dissection from one psoas major to the other psoas major uh, from the side great brilliant uh, that's not me so that is the reason why you have to go into the retrorectus plane why need why you need to do the reverse star that is because because there is a plane which does not exist in most patients that is number one point the second point is that uh, i'll just share a very uh, small story of a very uh, senior surgeon in one of the top 10 hospitals in the world okay let me not name names he was operating on a lateral hernia through an open lateral approach and he was trying to do a reverse star and he got lost and he called another surgeon with whom i was uh, there and we both went to this uh, surgeon and saw that he completely lost it i mean he had no clue about the anatomy because you know if you think tar is difficult going from lateral to medial is even more difficult it's enormously confusing unless you have your concepts really sorted out and that concept cannot be sorted out but just by looking at diagrams you need to really train for all this so unless you have anatomy at your fingertips and looking at it from behind it's not easy it's not your job you you're better off doing other things in life trust me unless you are a masochistic awr surgeon you're better off doing other things that's all yeah 
But I think this is what Miguel and his colleagues are doing in Madrid, offering courses hands-on, because otherwise you cannot learn the anatomy just by watching YouTube films. Yes. Miguel, please comment it. Un you. Unmute yourself, please. Yes, I, I really think it's, it's impor in, very important to be mentored in abdominal wall reconstruction. And I think that uh, if you are not familiar with posterior component separation, you cannot address properly a lateral incisional hernia, for sure. So first, experience in midline, and then go for lateral. And be mentored. I think it's not, you know, uh, it's, uh, I think, Jan, you, you, you stated this before. It's, it's important, you know, to, to have something near to, to, from which you can learn. And also, uh, we have learned a lot about in, in cadaver dissections. The, all, all, the, all the pictures that I have shown you is uh, the, during the last year's workshop that we are still trying to make the anatomy more and more clear where, uh, in order to facilitate our, our work. So it's, it's important to be mentor, of course, and, and, and forget about going there without any idea of posterior component separation because the true perpetual plane is really difficult to develop uh, medially as, uh, as Ram, I completely agree with him, and maybe it's, uh, you will have a tear for sure, uh, uh, unless your assistant is, 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 is good enough. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a question, Ram, I have a question for you. Oh, I, I, yes, because I, I, uh, now that I'm starting with the tap, I, I really tempted to to approach one of these L4 uh, or L3 uh, by ETEP. And, and my question is, uh, and when you close the, the muscles from behind, and I have shown you that there are three different layers or three different defects to come then together with the denervation, um, I think I I'm going to have the temptation to make like an hybrid to close the, the, the muscles after the ETEP. You know, this is my, you know, the, the first thing that I have in mind is maybe I can make it ETEP, I can reduce the hernia, I can make everything, but let me open to close the, the you know, amplicate the muscle. Is the, I'm on my right way or so I change my mind and go straight for ETEP? If it is- Only without hybrid. Yeah. So I think uh, hybrid is an excellent option. There's no question about it in my mind, especially if the sac is very big, you're, you're going to be doing a great job by uh, converting it into a hybrid. Um, purely in terms of defect closure, that is uh, something that uh, I really don't know. We don't have enough data yet. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, and particularly maybe lumbar, uh, most of them you can close them without problem, but the L3 in the iliac, sometimes I, I, it's been impossible for me to approximate the traversal of the muscle, completely impossible. What I am, what I, you know that what we are doing is reimplanting, reimplanting the lateral border of the traversal of the muscle defect lateral to the, to the mesh. You know, this is our way. We are doing it open. I don't know how I will manage this in ITEP. Have you reimplanted in ITEP? So uh, this is what uh, I was uh, talking about uh, during my talk, that we don't really uh, fix, get fixated on closing the defect as much as making the defect from a huge hollow to a flat surface. If you can make it a flat facial surface, your mesh is going to integrate. That big hole is not going to uh, work if, you, if you're going to try and close it together, it's not going to remain like a straight line uh, and muscle to muscle uh, connect with each other, um, unlike in the midline. That's simply not likely to happen in the uh, lateral abdominal lateral. wall. And I'm not sure anybody has shown that abdominal uh, wall function is uh, improved by closing the defects uh, which are located eccentrically. What do you think, Yam? What is your, you know more about hernia than put together. Oh, oh, oh. I see that you are in a holiday mode already. <laughs> no, no, I was just going through the chat if I missed something that I should address because 
There are other people around who probably did not dare to ask, uh, like uh, Madame Jane, any comments? But I asked you to comment. You're not commenting. Yeah, I haven't been listening to you. I've uh, been reading the chat. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Is it? <laughs> what was I talking? <laughs> So, no, what, uh, if you, gentlemen, if you uh, want to concentrate on that, what is your final message of this discussion? Miguel? Not final, let's, let's say message. Un uh, unmute yourself, it's much easier to listen to you. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. Now, now I can speak. Yes, yes. yes uh, take home messages are, uh, I think we all agree that um, these lateral interval hernias are, are really challenging, that needs a good comprehension of the, of the, of the anatomy boundaries. And uh, it's important to have experience, previous experience in posterior component separation, not anterior, in posterior component separation to, to approach these uh, lateral interval hernias. And, and, uh, and, and please be mentor to, in order to, 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 to get the, 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 the success with this. And I think that both ITEP and open approach could be both a, a excellent uh, ways to, to solve the problem of these lateral intestinal hernias. Okay, thank you. Javier? I agree with Miguel Angel. I think that uh, open and lab obviously are complementary, like in any, any other surgery in the in the human body, and uh, again, that it's a problem of of anatomy and feeling safe in the in the in the lateral uh, abdominal wall. So I think that we we must know both uh, approaches; they are complementary. And uh, the key question, the the the, the main point is uh, overlapping and overextended uh, dissection. Luis. Well, very similar. Uh, in my opinion, the, the anatomical knowledge is essential for approach this type of hernias. And um, when Javier says, is, um, and Ramana says too, and Miguel Angel, uh, the overlap is uh, enough, a uh, good overlap is essential and is very most important that fixation and uh, what, for me, the, the, this is the most important. Unmute, please. Yeah. Uh, lateral hernias are real complex hernias. And take home, uh, take home message for me is one should know the anatomy very well. And dissection and uh, uh, overlap of the mesh should be very uh, huge. And uh, it should be uh, more than 10 centimeters from all the sides or 10 or 15 centimeters from all the sides. And most importantly, one should have a training for this and have a mentorship before trying all such type of complex hernias in their day-to-day -day practice. That is what is my message. Well, if I should give a message, um, I would say don't be afraid of hybrid. Yeah. Because uh, this is not giving up the battle. It's just uh, making it for the difficult parts easier. Well, it sounds in my ears like Milos. You know, mm -hmm. taking the easy way around about the difficult part and then get the best conditions for that repair that you can. I mean, I remember the question I was asking you. So Miguel was asking about uh, closing the defect. And, uh, you know, we have a problem with a muscular defect close to a bony edge, which refuses to close. Of course. Right. So my uh, suggestion was thinking in terms of converting a kind of a funnel to a saucer, a flat one. So yeah. by kind of imbricating, I showed it in the video. I don't know if you saw it. I, I tried oh, yeah. to flatten the uh, hernia and make it, uh, you know, kind of shallow so that there is a facial interface with the mesh. Well, so that's the same the defect like you close the linea alba. So does that 
seem to be important uh, in the sense closing the lateral defect? Is it as important as closing the center? I think so, because uh, it is similar to how we deal with huge direct hernias. You know, we don't try to close the orifice of the huge hernia, although some people uh, bring it up and call it uh, TAPP plus, for example. Well, these things do not belong together, but we need to get them flat to have a better incorporation, especially in that adynamic area. And when you always deal with some kind of denervation there, I think this is important for the contour, for the patient too, and for the stability of the repair. Yeah, agree with that. That's right. Dr. Ramana. Dr. Ramana. Yes, please. Yeah, so the way you made the funnel in... Unmute, please. The way you made the funnel into a saucer with the suture, doesn't it kind of make it like a bio -A mesh, like a scaffold for the soft proline mesh? I in don't... a way, in a way from the sides, if you look at it, it's a three-dimensional way to look at it. It's looking yeah. like a bio -A mesh, which is called... Bio -A mesh is between the peritoneum and the muscle. Uh, I the... can't hear you guys. The bio -A mesh is between the mesh and the peritoneum. This is on the other side. So... Yes. That comparison really doesn't happen. Yeah. But it works on a similar template, doesn't it? <laughs> You're on giving it a good contour to fix. On the other side, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when I was a resident that there was a, um, um, a technique to repair incisional hernias by darn technique. Putting a lot of parts of suture, 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 just trying to close as much as possible. But if you cannot, they, they will work. work doing it was a, like a, making a mess with the sutures instead of, you know, was the darn technique. It's, uh, it's in the in, in main goats abdominal operation book. It's, uh, it's there. Yeah, we all must have yeah. done it uh, as residents, right, Miguel? I've done plenty. <laughs> well, I've, I've amended socks like that when I was six or seven <laughs> years old, but I think the things have changed since then a little bit. Sure. Okay. Well, exhaustive topic, yes. we'll have enough. but great, great that you spoke about it. As usually, we learn so much from each other. I, I wouldn't like to miss any. I know there is another webinar on lateral hernias tomorrow, but uh, I think my wife will kill me because I'm <laughs> hanging around, <laughs> hanging around computer <laughs> since yesterday in the morning. But uh, I would like to thank the speakers, Miguel, I saw you several hours today. Javier, see you once again in Madrid. I hope so. Luis, thank you. Pramod, Rahul, Ram, yeah, you, you have you. the last thank word because we are in eight minutes reaching the limit. Yeah, we won't take eight minutes. I just want to say that this is the last of the uh, smart talks that uh, we had designed. Basically, in, in a season where everybody is burnt out with webinars, we didn't want to sit completely idle because learning should not stop. We are alive. We have hope for tomorrow. We are surgeons. We don't stop learning about hernias because COVID may not last forever, but hernias will. So that was the uh, raison d'etre for continuing the smart talks. But today is the last one for 2020. In 2021, I hope we will all get together again. But that does not mean that uh, we will not be talking to each other and meeting uh, virtually. Uh, we will certainly do that. Uh, as I said, on 7th November, we have the ANZOR meeting. And we will have another big international meeting uh, in December uh, with Russia. So all of you, of course, will be invited. and. Uh, we will continue. We will continue. We uh, just love uh, learning and sharing and teaching. So we're going well, to. If you've seen my contribution to this event yesterday, I wrote hernia never stop. That's right. That's uh, right. Yeah. That's right. Thank you so much, Jan. Good. 
I loved thank having you. you as moderator. Thank you so much. You're the thank best. Thank you. Thank you. To all of you who were listening, Bye. thank you for the patience.